Good afternoon and welcome to today's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We have an excellent talk lined up for everyone today. Uh, I would like to begin by introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Pronovost. Dr. Pronovost is a world-renowned patient safety champion, innovator, critical care physician, a prolific researcher, entrepreneur, and a global thought leader informing U.S. and global health policy. His scientific work leveraging checklists to reduce catheter-related bloodstream infections has saved thousands of lives and earned him high-profile accolades, including being named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine, receiving a coveted MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 2008. Dr. Pronovost currently serves as the Chief Quality and Clinical Transformation Officer for University Hospitals, a comprehensive health system with a national reputation for providing world-class healthcare, research, and education. Headquartered in Cleveland, uh, University Hospitals has annual revenues of 4.4 billion, 20 hospitals, more than 50 health centers and outpatient facilities, and over 200 physician offices located throughout 16 counties. As Chief Quality and Clinical Transformation Officer, Dr. Pronovost is charged with fostering ideation and implementation for new protocols to eliminate defects in value and thereby enhance quality of care, developing new frameworks for population health management for UH's more than 1 million patients, and managing the UH Accountable Care Network, one of the nation's largest, compromising more than 581,000 members. And in this role, Dr. Pronovost leads the system in championing a new narrative that focuses on keeping people healthy at home. Utilizing his previously successful concepts of checklists, Dr. Pronovost created a new uh, list of key principles for eliminating defects and value and has incorporated the framework into an analytic platform, integrating claims, electronic medical record, and scheduling data to make defects and value visible to clinicians. In just 12 months, this work fueled a reduction in annual costs per patient in the UH, uh, in, in, in the UH ACO by 9%. Dr. Pronovost also serves as a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and School of Nursing. Previously, Dr. Pronovost served as the Senior Vice President for Patient Safety and Quality at John, Johns Hopkins uh, Medicine, as well as the Founder and Director of the Johns Hopkins Medicine Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality. In this role, he worked to eliminate all harms in one health system following on his success in, in eliminating uh, one harm in most health systems across the US. Uh, Dr. Pronovost also served as the Senior Vice President for Clinical Strategy and the Chief Medical Officer for United Healthcare. Dr. Pronovost has, uh, was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2011, elected as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and has received multiple honorary degrees. Dr. Pronovost is an advisor to the World Health Organization, uh, World Alliance for Patient Safety and uh, regularly addresses the US Congress on patient safety issues. In response to a White House executive order, Dr. Pronovost co-chaired the Healthcare Quality Summit to modernize the Department of Health and Human Services uh, quality measurement system. Uh, he earned his medical degree from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore. He completed his anesthesiology and critical care medicine residency, as well as a fellowship in critical care medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And he earned his PhD in clinical investigation from the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Pronovost. Dude, that was probably the longest introduction someone ever gave me. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So the theme that we're putting for safety work is to be an illuminator. And, and it links with our concepts of why the secret of great care is love. So let me just take a minute to explain that. And Mark, thanks for uh, suggesting that. With the time change now, when you walk outside at night, if you get out on time, you'll see the sun back to its rightful radiant place uh, in the sky. And even late in the afternoon, it warms and illuminates all of us. Uh, David Brooks' recent book on how to be a luminator points out that we often are, or at least in times in our life, either an illuminator or a diminisher. Uh, illuminators see the good 
in other people and they vibrate, they create energy, they inspire them, they encourage them to go do better. They know themselves deeply and their strengths and flaws so they could know other people's de deeply and give that deep sense of compassion. Uh, illuminators are the opposite. They make people feel small. They make them feel like they can't solve problems, that they're ideas aren't worthy. And I'm sure all of you have had moments in life where you had a really, really good idea and you just got brushed off or someone didn't listen to you. And that's really, really dangerous. You see, because with this being safety week for all of us, it serves us well to reflect upon what is the state of safety in American medicine. And that's not to say you all don't do great amazing things every day, or that we haven't made great progress. But nationally, there's several recent studies and OIG reports <clears throat> that suffice to say one in four hospitalized patients are harmed. A decade ago, one in four hospitalized patients have harmed. Two decades ago, one in four hospitalized patients are harmed. Three decades ago, one in four hospitalized patients are harmed. There is no other high-risk industry industry that has been flat. Indeed, if you look at automobile safety, airline safety, rail safety, nuclear safety, it's been an exponential decreasing curve. We still have about one in two people leaving their healthcare experience saying they're afraid what to do when they leave because they're not sure what to do. We still have a third of every healthcare dollar wasted, uh, over $1.4 trillion. And we have healthcare as the number one cause of personal bankruptcy. So the approaches to solving this have never been more important. I believe part of the reason why we haven't made progress is because we haven't deeply applied this beliefs or this philosophy that the secret of great care, great care is love. And so we're going to be exploring that uh, today. I wanna share though, the illuminators all around us. And uh, Jen Lorenz in her you know, report of Hidden Gems described the uh, one of our cashiers, Cindy Penniman, you may have seen her. She works in the CMC cashier. Keith, I see you know her. And she is just vivacious. I mean, she is an illuminator, right? I mean, she is since people are suffering and is there to to uplift them. I mean, she there's no other world that word that she just gives you a hug through the cash register. She's out talking to people. She's so energetic. And when we were interviewing her, she had this kind of beautiful quote about everybody's role. She says, "You know, I'm not a nurse that can take care of you. I'm not a doctor that can heal you, and I can't give out any medicines. But I, but what I do have is a love for giving people happiness in the morning." and because I have plenty to spare. I mean, imagine what UH would be like if all of us thought about the love and we have plenty to spare. And she's one of many, many examples of people who we're really fortunate to have and who all of us can choose to be like. We have that capacity should we choose to do it. Now you may all be aware that our safety program at UH is lazily focused on zero harm. And we group harm into four categories where we may be adding a fifth, but they, they are zero physical harm from complications. That's that one in four people who suffer harm. Amongst those complications, medication harms are the most, surgical harm second, and then harms from general medical care like cauti, clabsy, pressure injuries, falls. Second, zero suffering from delayed access or from uh, having a disrespectful care as you know, access is one of the biggest areas in inequities because if you, or perhaps unless you know someone or you're a board member, you often have really long waits to get into specialized care. And we've created this whole workaround system where we leverage other executives, but it doesn't work for those who don't have that privilege. Eliminating waste and a lot of efforts to get rid of that 30% spend that's bankrupting us and, and the country. And then eliminating inequities, which are just ramp it in everywhere that we look. Now, I said the secret of quality is love, and some of you may, and many people criticize that that's hokey, but let me explain to you what 
we mean by that and why it's highly, highly disciplined and evidence-based. Love is this energy that is in all of us and uplifts and connects us all. You don't need to do anything to earn it. You're born with that right. What that says is that we all have a right to have our voice heard, to raise ideas, to help solve problems, to have agency, to be treated with respect, not because I have a certain degree after my name or a title after me, just because I am. And too often, we don't lead with love. We, other people, we say, if you don't have the right degree, you didn't go to the right school, you don't have the right length of your white coat, you, you didn't, you, your skin's not the right color, you stutter like I do, your voices count less. You know, often to the time that people start to believe that they actually are less worthy and they don't speak up. And when we doing that, we demean, we demoralize, and we destroy value. You destroy the very thing that we're trying to do is solve problems because you shut down ideas. You stall learning and improvement, and we are never going to get better. But when you lead with love, the opposite it happens. You accept good ideas from wherever they come. You don't care who brings it. All you care about is what's the what's the idea. You create this kind of vivacious, effervacious energy that people are solving problems, their voice is heard, and they're, they're, they're innovating. And love doesn't mean that this is just some feel-good philosophy. Love is the path to results. Why? Because we know if we engage every employee on the problems we're solving, we're going to learn faster, better, cheaper than if we sub-segment and say only people who have a certain title after their name. If we allow ideas to flow, flow freely across the system, we're going to innovate and learn faster and solve problems faster. And that's when you have this idea of connecting people, what we do. And importantly, love is also allows us to be accountable. You see, for most of these safety problems, the evidence of what we need to do is well known. It's been known for years. We just don't do it. And healthcare has a profoundly underdeveloped accountability system. It's kind of like a voluntary system. I could have something that improves harm, but whether or not a patient receives it is for the most part, if clinicians want to do it or, or, or not. Um, maybe good reasons why we don't, but there's a whole lot of systems that we tolerate that the right things don't happen and we don't have robust shared accountability system. And love is powerful and strong enough for you to be in the spotlight, shining your brilliance, but also to be under the spotlight to say, not cool, we have to get these problems solved. How do we work together? Now, our path to getting to zero harm is really these three steps of a journey. And again, they're quite evidence-based. The first is ensure every member of UH sees that their purpose is to improve value. They may have another job, they will have another job, but they also have a job to improve value and they should feel empowered to solve that. Why is that belief important? Because there's compelling data that if you have an organizational purpose, that organization does no better than an organization without a purpose. Unless, and that's the big caveat, a supervisor level or below connects to that purpose. That is, they say, I get, the job that I do is achieving whatever that goal, in our case, to getting to, to, to zero harm. And if we save lives every day, if we can't connect people to our purpose, we got a real problem. It's pretty damn easy. You just have to talk about it. But too often, we don't do that. And we have a very intentional effort across UH to do that. Second is belonging. That is, do we have a structure and culture that allows the free flow of ideas. Why is that? Because again, the data is just profound that innovation flourishes when you create a vehicle to allow diverse ideas to meet, mature, multiply. If, I mean, if you look at all of the top restaurants in the world are this eclectic collection of a chef was born in Thailand, they trained in Norway, and they opened a restaurant in New Orleans with Creole food, right? And they bring this diverse, eclectic innovation to drive performance. And we don't have structures in that in healthcare. We have a lot of silos, but when we unleash them, we could. Third piece of our transformation roadmap 
is building discipline management and accountability systems. There's some brilliant work by uh, Stanford economist, Nick Bloom, who looks at management systems in healthcare. And the conclusion is very simply, good management matters. Good management is almost entirely absent. And basic things like, do you know your goals and roles for products you're on? Do you have feedback on performance? And do you have any kind of accountability where you're reviewing performance? So this Believe, Belong, Build is our transformation framework to say, how do we take that living and leading with love principles and now make it real in our UH environment? I wanted to show you some efforts. We're repeating these I will statements now in safety week. We have these for all of our roles across UH. Here are some EVS workers. And I want you to see the words and what underlies them. What do they say is I'm, I'm going to stop believing I'm just a health housekeeper and I'm going to start believing that I play a critical role in the safety and well-being of those we serve. In other words, they didn't feel love. They felt separated. They felt less than. And imagine how much powerful it will be if every one of these employees was energized that they were connected to purpose. Same thing with transport versus. My voice isn't heard. And I'm going to start believing that if I speak up, changes will happen. Again, our goal with this leading in love is to unleash and inspire every employee. Yet too often, our managers, our leaders treat people like they're fleas in a jar. And let me give you the metaphor. There's some experiments that say if you put fleas in a jar, they'll immediately jump out if there's no lid on it because they don't like being in a jar. If you put a lid on it, they'll hit their head two or three times and then they'll stop jumping high enough so they don't bump their head anymore. But when you then take the cap off, they never jump out of the jar. They've been conditioned to stay in their box, right? And too often across America, across the world, healthcare employees feel like they've had that lid on the jar. They have brilliant ideas. I can't tell you how often we hear, oh, I can solve this problem. <clears throat> and but they don't feel that they're unleashed and inspired. They feel like I can't jump out of my box because I'm not in my swim lane. And I can trust you and staff is in leadership, seems to leadership. I want to speak for you, but I have 100% confidence. They want you to jump out of the jar, right? They want to empower you. You are empowered to raise ideas, to solve it. And, and so start jumping. You know, the other story about the power of what you all could accomplish is this beautiful story of Death Valley. Now, Death Valley, actually prior to global warming, was the most dry, desolate place in the earth. Now it actually has like a two mile wide lake, go figure, but it got preciously little rain. And in 2004, they had a fluke rainstorm and they got like an inch or two of rain. And that Death Valley, the picture on the left, <clears throat> a month later turned into a carpet of majestic wildflowers <clears throat> a month later. And you say, well, what changed? How on earth did a little rain make this happen? And the reality is those seeds of brilliance and beauty were always there. They just needed some watering. They needed to be encouraged and unleashed. And your being an illuminator is that water, right? Think if you're like a flower gardener, you're watering and inspiring all of our staff to solve these problems that we swim with uh, every day. <clears throat> Second detail now we'll go into is how do you build systems that you people feel like they belong to a learning community? We're a huge health system. CMC alone is an enormous complex piece. Well, it's not all that hard. Nature has shown us the way. Our lungs, our capillaries, our glomeruli, ferns, snowflakes are all this structure called a fractal. Sounds fancy. All it means is in nature, if things wanted to grow, if they had a right new genetic code for every time they wanted to get bigger, it would be highly efficient. So they developed this structure called fractals, which are just identically shaped and varying size structure. So you grow by just repeating a structure, but in smaller levels, flowers, trees, all, all have this. And the beauty of them is they allow for three things. <laughs> One is they allow people to have a seat at the table to co-create goals because fractals operate by simple rules. And our simple rule is every higher level of the organization needs to have a table where every lower level has a voice. 
And you see that cascading throughout the quality structure that Brett built here at, at CMC. And if the table gets too crowded, make another branch, which is what we did in the markets. But the idea is everyone has a seat so they can have a voice in making sure the goals are wise. We create a mechanism for horizontal communication. So surgery can l learn from medicine or learn from OB, but we also have vertical communication results matter. So if we're not hitting our results, that there's a forum to say, okay, why not? And how do we support that? And though it seems messy, it is this beautiful orchestration of allowing ideas to flow freely anywhere we have in the community. And I can't tell you how often we've had a safety innovation happen at one of our community hospitals. And because we have the forums, literally the next day, there's a mechanism to diffuse it across all of our, our organizations rather than hoping we have emails. I think the firms could learn from each other and creating forums like this. They only work though, if the culture allows the free flow of ideas. In other words, if you have to have certain stature or evidence to speak up and you squelch the free flow of ideas or you embarrass people if they speak up and they're not, they may not have the right ideas, you stifle all the benefits of this. Again, which is why if we don't live and lead with love, none of this improvement is possible. Story about the power of innovating and sharing ideas. In the late 1940s, London was full of two types of melodious songbirds, the red robins and the bluebirds. And they used to thrive in London because they peck through the tops of the milk containers that people left on stoops. They sucked the fat out and they were really chubby, really healthy birds. But then the companies changed the containers from cardboard and steepled to aluminum and flat. And both birds are equally smart. So a few of both birds learned the new way to peck. They had to tuck their beak more. But the robins are extinct in London now, and the bluebirds thrive. And the only difference is the robins are solitary birds. They have their stoop or their corner. You may call it your role, your department, your division, your hospital. And that wisdom never disseminated. The bluebirds are flocking birds. They have a structure to fly together and a culture that allows the free flow of ideas. So that wisdom quickly separate, spread. And if I think almost every problem we're facing at UH, somewhere across our system, often at CMC alone, somebody's hitting it out of the park, but we don't have that fractal structure. We're still too much like the red robins to allow that innovation to flourish. And if we don't know here, it's almost certainly somewhere else in another health system. And we have to make sure that we're much more like the bluebirds. Okay, third, our discipline management system. You know, too often a management system here in healthcare means if something goes off the rails, I have a fire drill and I send texts and say, Mark, what the hell's going on with this? Go do something about it, right? It's in every day, is a fire drill. It's, it's what you all live every day and it is exhausting and highly ineffective. You see, if you have a management system, there's no drama. I mean, you have a couple key things to know you have a management system. One is you have a run chart with some slope other than zero. In other words, you're moving the needle. You don't, you're not just saying my measure of success is I held meetings, but I have some measure and it's mo moving in some directory. Two is their self-reinforcing or controlling. You don't need to have a whole lot of fire drills. And as the executive, you don't even need to take a lot of energy because the local leader of that, if there's any signal that it's going awry, they immediately intervene. They dig in, they find out what's gone. They re-change re the system and they're self-correcting, just like nature's self-correcting. And so there's not a lot of drama. There's just performance. And third, there's some mechanism for accountability that if someone or an area isn't doing well, it's not ignored. There's a team that dives right in, digs in in real time and says, okay, how do we support you? So that our way of defining a management system, and we have trainings on this if anyone's interested is, is are you clear about the goals, roles and responsibilities, right? And I would just ask any of you in projects, if that answer is no, we probably need to clarify. Have we built an enabling infrastructure? That means, if you have a key behavior that you want to change, are you getting feedback on that? 
ideally at an individual clinician level as close to real time and possible. And then both your relative performance over time, excuse me, your performance over time as a run chart and then relative performance to your peers because that really motivates people as a rank order. Uh, and our goal is every provider has their boats lifted. Third is have you created that structure to engage and connect? That is, do you have that fractal? If you're working on something, how are you learning from each other so that we accelerate improvement? And then last is, have we reported transparently and have shared accountability? And, and I wanna go through and what I mean by shared accountability, because it's probably one of the most missing things. And I'll you, use a couple examples. We have interventions on our units that we know work whether it's med safety practices, if we do that, whether it's infection prevention practices, whether it's patient experience practices. In this case, we'll talk about an example of doing an annual wellness visit for Medicare patients. Without a doubt, it makes a difference. But we, like most of the country, we're doing it 14% of the time. We have 120,000 Medicare beneficiaries, huge task. So we put a program to support people doing it. We set a goal of 60%. And we hit about half of our 500 or so primary care docs got it. So what in the past would have been our current lack of accountability? We would have stopped there. Okay, we may have hit our goal, but there's still half the people not meeting the goal, but there was no follow-up mechanism. But we know if our goal is zero harm, that's not acceptable. It's inconsistent with our values. So we celebrated those who hit it, reached out to those who didn't and said, you didn't hit your goal. We will hit your goal and reach out to these clinicians if you want coaching or hear someone on our quality team who you, you can go reach out to, but not hitting the goals in an answer. That got it down from like, say, 200 docs to maybe 75 docs who just didn't engage with that training. So we escalated the accountability saying our goal in the UH is zero harm. This performance is contributing harm. We have to do better. So please, we reached out to you before, you didn't engage, send us in writing how you're going to drive performance, right? That kind of follow-up is almost never done. Just that act alone, people are like, oh, I didn't realize you're really serious about this. I thought it was like kind of optional, got it down to like 10 docs. This is again out of 500. So 10 docs still not engaging saying, okay, we reached out a lot of ways, you didn't choose to engage, please schedule a meeting with us. We either will engage or we're going to enter this into an FPPE, so a quality corrective action, because it is a corrective action. We can't have a known safety practices that reduces harm and costs and electively not choosing to do this. And again, just that kind of nudge, all but one who said, you know what? I don't know that I want to work in a health system who is going to have us accountable for, for quality. And my response was, I'm not sure we want a physician who doesn't want to be accountable for quality. So it's probably a good, a, a good separation. But I think that lack of accountability is a major part of why we still have one in four hospitalized patients. So enough about theory. I want to share with you very briefly some results to say this isn't theoretical. Like this is, um, and I've had a 25 years in quality. I have never seen a health system that if you use this approach, you hit it out of the park. And I'd ask I me, mean, the quality leaders see it all the time. It's, I don't say it's a magic formula, but it, it works. If, if we don't do these things, we struggle. If you do these things, they work. So here's an example of system-wide ERAS enrollment. Again, across all of our hospitals of 15 service lines, you know, well over 1,200 patients a month getting enrolled in this. And not surprisingly, their length of stay goes down. Our Sentinel events across UH just plummeting with some really standard practices that, that we do. The med safety, classic example of accountability. We went for years with a flat line, whole lot of effort being spent, but I would say no management system. What changed for this is we started reporting data or had the ability to report data at a nursing unit level and the nurse managers owned it and reported data to the individual nurses, right? And that skyrocketed. And it it's, was done, again, in shared accountability. Same thing if you look at Omnicell override, right? Real issues with safety. We had been relatively flat and putting these kind of management and accountability systems 
have unprecedented reforms. System-wide length of stay, huge opportunity. We have to update this, but again, driving performance for all providers. We have some providers that have huge variation in some ways, like 80% longer length of stay. What I would remind you what that means is having some group of providers with an 80% longer length of stay is as if we closed 80% of those beds. And we have a community that has pretty intense healthcare needs who needs those beds. And quite frankly, it's a moral issue to say for no reason other than we're not practicing these things. If 80, you're blocking 80% of our beds, we can't just sit there and watch that. We have to make sure we're doing all the things we can so that we don't deny people access to care because otherwise these patients just back up in, in the ED. Here's some of that annual wellness data that I said just breathtaking uh, across such a large population to get the results. I want to now just pivot to some chronic disease people. So most of this effort has been hospital focused. We have a large population health effort. We have over 600,000 people in our ACO who were responsible for the, their care. And I just want you to look at some of these data on, on how many people have various types of disease. And Aparna, I see you in the back. I applaud you for all your work on CKD and helping to mature our systems of excellence in, in, in CKD. But you look at these patients and you know, somewhere between a 25 and a 30% rate of 90 day uh, readmissions. I mean, that, some, that says in many cases, a third of our hospital beds are filled with people who came back and likely could have been avoided if we did certain things. These are just some other diseases. Again, some data that we dug into saying, well, where do we have defects in care? And for chronic diseases, we have this framework, I won't bore you with it, but it basically says very simply, who's diagnosed or staged, who's on guideline concordant therapy, who has their symptoms and physiology controlled, who had, was screened for behavioral health and received behavioral health, same thing, screen for SDOH and received behavioral SDOH. And then likewise, who avoided needless admissions? You know, let me just give you some national data. For diabetes, it's probably around 60% of people are diagnosed, the rest aren't. It's around 10% are on guideline concordant therapy. 11% have their physiology controlled. 2% are screened for behavioral health, while 50% have it. And if you have behavioral health issues with any chronic disease, it doubles your cost. And about 90% have avoidable ED visits and hospitalizations. And all of you see that every day because these admissions that many of you get are the result of the lack of managing that. But we're swimming in, in, in defects, but they're all invisible. Some of the great work that Aparna and our ACO and others are doing are making them visible. So we started developing metrics in this and you know, give, give you a great example. Aparna figured out that for about 76% of our patients, we weren't sending an albumin to creatinine ratio, which means we really had no chance of getting them on guideline concordant therapy because to stage people, you need that, you need that ratio. So huge opportunity for us to better manage people and get them on the right care. We developed this approach, what we call systems of excellence. And I won't bore you with the details, but what it says is we make these defects visible. We partner primary care with specialty care to say, okay, when a patient with this disease comes in, what should we do together, right? The specialists often their insights, primary care kind of makes it practical to say, okay, I have a 15 minute visit. How the hell do I do all this? And it was a really healthy debate to try to navigate that. And then we screen people to try to get, get them improved. Like I'll give you an example and I'll, uh, call out Dr. Hadapakolo, you know, who runs our diabetes program. We, I mentioned the diabetes efforts and she was saying, you know, Peter, most of the people I see in clinic don't need me to see them if we had some checklist or protocol for primary care, but they are uncontrolled patients who really need my services. And so we said, okay, Batul, let's think about designing a system to meet diabetes patients needs. We have about 54,000 diabetic patients in our ACO. How many endocrinologists do we have who do diabetes? And she said, you know, I don't know, two or three. 
And how many patients could you each care for if all you did is diabetes? And she's like, I don't know, maybe a thousand. I said, okay, the math doesn't work, right? We have 54,000 people who have diabetes and you could do 3,000, think of a new model. And so we prototyped this model like we did with CKD and supported some of her time to say, Batul, why don't you just screen uncontrolled patients and use your wisdom to say, this patient needs a new med like a GLP-1, this patient needs diabetic education, this patient needs pharmacy referral, four minutes of chart, four minutes of chart. She screened about 10,000 patients and we just uh, was just accepted for publication, the largest diabetes study to date, where we took just under a thousand patients and dropped their A1C by 1.5 points, simply by being like Harry Potter sorting hat and navigating people to get close these gaps in care. Um, you know, here's an example of heart failure and our heart failures were, I mean, inspired by this. If this was done in a culture of judging, you could think they'd be petrified. So we looked at our patients and the, we had about 20% of people who should have been on triple therapy were on it. Again, and again, this is largely invisible across the country. This is probably a little bit better that looks like the national average is 10. And of quadruple P therapies, it's 8%. What's striking is there was no difference between if you're seen by cardiology or primary care, and perhaps in part because most of the cardiology were interventional cardiologists who were seeing these people probably because they did some procedure. And about half these patients, you know, hadn't seen a cardiologist or their PCP within three years, right? And so we wonder why we have such high readmission rates because we haven't designed a management system to drive performance. Now, I will suffice to say the work that the ACO team is doing is hit it out of the park. So here's our shared savings that we get from these a ACOs growing from about $7 million a year to now just under 50. Uh, as you know, we lost money last year with our investments. We made money, but our overall net income was about $120 million. What that means is that value payments now of 50 million that go to our bottom line are over a third of our net income from managing populations. And this is only growing, which is why we all have to begin to be coordinated on the, the, these efforts. But it won't happen without every one of you being an illuminator. And how might we accelerate that effort? Well, one of the efforts that we do with all of the transformation teams is we've defined these principles for thriving. And they're, 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 we're not calling them values because they're really behaviors. And they're quite simple. They are I am humble, curious, and compassionate because without those things, you can't innovate and improve. I respect, appreciate, and help others. And I'm accountable to continuously improve myself, my organization, and my communities. And I would ask any one of you is how are we living that? You can put a top line on love or being an illuminator around this, but it's the values that say I'm really committed to creating an organization and personally that we work towards zero harm. And so I'd like to open up with some questions to say, what might your I will statement be for this new safety week and continuing it through the year? Things like I'm gonna be an illuminator, I'm gonna um, not do diminishing behaviors because I know you've all seen them. We unfortunately live them all the day um, will I practice and respect and uplift others? How will I encourage that free flow of ideas, whether creating a factal or when someone raises something to me, I'll say, oh, tell me more. I, I want to understand that and encourage people to be the fleas jumping out of the jar. How could I ensure that the teams feel valued? Right, Simple way we start rounds off in each morning by simply having teammates recognize who on the team did something above and beyond that day or in the last week for them? How will we begin to spread a culture of love where everyone feels respected and unleash my illumination? And if you have data, how could we begin to say, I'm going to move the needle on just one thing that I do? You see, healthcare has a ton of headwinds that we face. Uh, and I think for too long, we've accepted that harm is inevitable rather than preventable. Uh, 
we've just accepted that, hey, when you're a place like CMC and you care for really sick people, harm's going to happen. We're going to have long length of stay. And I don't believe that's the case because I've seen here from all of you that there's pockets of brilliance that when we get this type of living and leading with love, where we build our people believe that they're inspired, where we build learning communities, where we belong to a, a way to learn and innovate, we can get to zero and we often do. So love to open it up to questions or comments. And most importantly, what's your I will statement going to be to continue on this journey to zero harm? Yep. yep. Go ahead. I don't need a microphone. And I think we could unmute people online. If so, if anyone online could also ask questions. I mean, I think I will always be patient centered and always treat everybody who works with me, no matter what they do with respect and collegiality. I think that creates the right environment. Um, my, my laptop just died, but there were some people feel more emboldened, I think in the comments to make, say things. So I don't know if there's any way there's comments in the chat. Uh, maybe, maybe somebody could, like I said, my, my laptop died from clinic this morning. Yeah, perfect. Karen, do you want to read the chat comments up here, if you don't mind? And then I could just, uh, you could see which ones the answers is so I could respond to the questions. No, or you could just come up here and screen them. I don't care, like, just so we know which ones. Uh, um. Ah, okay, let me just go environmental harm. Really, really good point. I think I mentioned, I alluded to, but then I got Chanchencha that we're going to add in fifth harm. Our fifth harm is harm environmental harm. It's enormous. It's underrepresented. It's hard to measure. I know uh, Sanjay Rajapolin is doing amazing work on that and we'll be working with him. So yes, we will be having five harms because environmental harm is super, super important. Uh, Keith, to your point, I just want to applaud you because uh, having worked with you and watched your rounds, I have no doubt you're a role model of, no, seriously, Keith, of, of treating everybody equal, of encouraging the flow of ideas, of role modeling that for our house staff. But it, it, it's powerful because that's not always the case. Well, this one is about, um, from Dr. Eisenberg, about the length of stay and how it's correlated with prolonged waiting times for nursing home placement, especially on the weekends, and that there really hasn't been any improvement in this. And how can we show love to those insurance companies and nursing homes? Yeah, so uh, remember, love also includes accountability. So uh, our uh, care transitions team under Brooke Nunner and Anthony Muni have done a lot of work in this. It may not be visible to you. For most of our plans, we now, well, during COVID, we had waivers for requiring prior off for SNF over the weekend because it was just so much delays. Some of our plans still have uh, that um, waived, but you're absolutely right. It's a frustration, a ton of work going on in that. And you know, and I would also encourage us to say, we still have maybe 20% or 30% of the patients who go to SNF could probably go home, especially with home health or our virtual home clinic. And so I would avoid that delay potentially by driving performance uh, to get people at home. Other comments or I will statements? So I'm up here just to encourage folks to speak up, show the love, don't be afraid. Who's got an I will statement? I've got the mic. Think about your relationship with other caregivers, taking care of your patients. What can you do? What can you do with your peers, with others on the team? What are you going to do different? Hey, you know, can I address the the late notes and fear and and, and punitive because I um I, this is kind of like such an important tension in in accountability, and I mentioned that term shared accountability and and leading with love, and the idea behind this is I believe that most clinicians are people are well-intentioned. They want to do the right thing. And if they don't, there's often barriers. And I would say, you know, this approach to quality or accountability has too often been, you know, in the past, I wash my hands of any responsibility 
and point the finger at you and say, Sue, why aren't you doing this? You're, like, You're responsible for this. And oftentimes Sue may not even know the goal. And, you know, and I remember in my prior organization, they had a really high rate of SSI, surgical side infections in neurosurgery. And the head of neurosurgery came to me and was be, this was being presented at the board and he was clearly being embarrassed. He's like, and it, I wasn't asking him to do this, but the other leadership were. And he said, Peter, I don't want these infections, but I'm a neurosurgeon. So I don't know how, you know, I'm not sure what I do. Support me, don't embarrass me. And, and I think too often we treat accountability as not having resources. And as I mentioned, we're not there perfectly across UH, but our believe deeply that a higher level leader should only hold a lower level leader accountable if we first set them up to be successful and hold ourselves accountable to build this management system. So if we're working on docs on infection or whatever these things are, like the response wouldn't be, you know, Brett, why aren't you doing this? It would be, Okay, have I made sure Brett knows the goals, roles, and responsibility? Does Brett know even what the behavior is changing? Do you get feedback on data? And most of the times, those things solve the problem. It, it doesn't mean we don't eventually ratchet up and there has to be some punitive, but vast majority of the problems are solved by uh, eliminating those barriers. Peter, thank you. I I, I want to speak to that comment that's up there. Uh, Stathi Centeniatis, I'm the president here at Cleveland Medical Center. I haven't really had the privilege to be in this forum before, thanks to Peter and Pierre. Um, so I would say, you know, Peter walked us through a lot of very important, uh, simple, eloquent, but powerful examples. And the example about the fleas um, that have been conditioned to not jump out of the jar that doesn't just apply to individuals, it applies to organizations, right? So we are an organization that in some ways, many ways, has been conditioned to not be able to think outside its own box. I think the example that uh, was brought up there around you know, punishing doctors by charging late fees is a perfect example of an organization that is basically trapped within the box. The ability though, for people to bring this up and uh, bring it up in a respectful, professional manner and question why do we continue to do things that are clearly uh, counter to the culture that we're trying to promote. It's not that our culture is not real. It's just that our culture has a lot, um, a long way to go before it, it actually illuminates all these dark areas of the organization. We do have many poor practices in the organization. They're not by design, they're not intentional, they're an outcome of history. And together through forums like this is where we can actually break down those bad practices and eliminate them where appropriately. We need to continue to hold ourselves accountable to things that are important as it relates to our core focus on safety, quality, the best outcomes for our patients, but there are better ways to do it. So. It's not an excuse other than reframing to uh, just you know, present that perspective that as an organization, we have a long way to go. As individuals, we have a long way to go. But in a culture where we can all believe that we can make a difference, we know that our perspectives will be uh, respected and listened to, that's how we're going to make progress. So thank you for a lot of these comments. It would actually be really helpful if we can copy them and share them with leadership. Yeah, great. And I lo love that organizational, it's like the, 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 fly the, the lip lid on the fleas, because I think it's very true. You know, just to give you an example that th we don't just talk about this. When we are trying to roll out use of a new evidence-based practices, right? You can see signing notes is one of those. And again, I can't say it's it's perfect, but we, to remove barriers, look at what we call these five A's of what are the barriers to not using an evidence-based practice. And the first is, are clinicians aware? Many times they're not, and that alone does it. Do they agree? There's a lot of times, and Keith and I had many discussions where we may disagree on the evidence, right? But that doesn't come from bullying because it won't work. It comes from then having a discussion about, do we need to revise the protocol? How are you interpreting the evidence versus somebody else? But it's a respectful conversation. 
Third is ambiguity, which is by far the biggest re reason that the guideline or whatever you're asking people to do, you're not communicating clearly and people are just confused. I have no idea who you're asking to do, what you want me to do, and reducing that ambiguity helps. A fourth is ability. Like, okay, I want to do this, but I just don't have time or whatever the areas, I don't have the equipment or the training. And then last is aligned incentives, which are a huge issue for many of our physicians that like, okay, I get you want me to do this, but then I'm going to get punished for my RVUs or some other things on the other end. How do we try to balance that, that, that uh, growth? The fundamental premise though of living and leading with love is that we assume people are good. Right. And and doesn't mean we don't ratchet up escalation, but we come to the which is almost always true. You want to do the right thing. The organization wants to do the right thing. How do we support each other to make that happen? And if I can just uh, add to what Peter just said, because there was a great example that came up this morning on the uh, ED uh, quality meeting. Dr. Romani came. I don't know if he's on the line or someone else from cardiology that was there, but he came to all the emergency department physicians and talked about. Um, the how it's going now with the new troponin um, uh, that we've switched to, and then also looking at what do we do specifically for non-STEMI patients, and is there a protocol that we need to develop to help them? And I thought it was just a great example of this because, again, the cardiologists can make recommendations, but the, it's the emergency uh, room physicians that meet many of the challenges that Peter just uh, brought up in terms of being able to have um, a bed, being able to have a provider. And remember, this was a system meeting. So it's not so much what CMC is, um, has available to them, but think about the Samaritans of the world or the Conneauts of the world, you know, where there's not as many specialists available to help make decisions. And so they agreed to work together to come up with a model that's going to work for all of our hospitals. And so I thought that was a great idea, a great example of what you just said, because no one had a hierarchy there. Everybody had a role and everybody had a role in patient care, but they have to work together to make a, make a, a, a good plan. Other examples or other uh, folks that want to speak up? We've just got about five or six minutes. Karen Keith's good. At... <laughs> well, I'll just say a, a shout out to Karen Boyd. Um, I was an intern here in 1986 and Karen was a staff nurse in Lakeside 40, which is a gym medical floor. It was a, nursing was incredibly strong back in those days. And uh, Karen was a fantastic nurse and has just been the most dedicated person to quality in the 36 years I've been here. So yay, Karen. Yeah, thank you. And now she remembers that I was on call one night and what not much was going on and we played hangman, <laughs> so, uh, right? You, you tell that story. Um, no duty hours, anyway. My my series that was my other comment is it seems like everything we do in a big complex place like UH um, had to do with balancing resources with outcomes, doing what we can with the resources we have. So from a quality perspective, for instance, I think it would be ideal to 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 have a, a committee or a group review every patient that bounces back in three days and see what happened, try to learn from it. Every patient the ER admits who goes to the ICU in 12 hours, look at that case and say, was a mistake made or is there something we can learn from it? And I just feel like, especially post-pandemic finances, resources are tight. And we, we're constantly having this balance between not going broke and, and you know, we're not for profit, but we can't go broke. We have this balance between not going broke and then, and then strategically using resources where we can to do the best for our patients. And it's an incredible challenge. And us, I'm sure you and Stathis and, Brett and Jason, you know, try to deal with this every day. From my perspective, I mean, there's things we could do, like the things I mentioned. So, yeah, and we did the now that Epic finding those cases is a lot easier, and so that you know, and we do have some, some symptoms. And you know, Keith, let, let me go back to this leading with love because when we review those, what is often the barrier, and this may seem to oversimplify it, but is our current model of care is almost always reactive and transactional rather than proactive and relational. In other words, we'll have a patient who gets readmitted. These are true stories. And we realize that, well, she has anxiety, but it was never diagnosed. Or she missed appointments because she uh, 
didn't have respite care because she was caring for a disabled granddaughter after her daughter died of an overdose or true story. The patient had some fear of leaving her cat alone and would never go to the doctor. Cause I mean, and, and these are real things that if we're going to solve this, we have to start thinking relational, not just they show up in the ED. I, I need to do my job well transactionally, but I need to connect upstream and downstream in a better, in a more wholesome way uh, than we do, or I do my job in the hospital and they go out and, you know, I'm not so worried about what's going on because we'll never give excellent care unless we start doing uh, more relational care. Hey, uh, Zach Schulman, I'm a medical student. Um, uh, my I will is to uh, see things as works in progress. And my question I think that, um, you know, value and quality uh, can be used kind of interchangeably. Value is seen sometimes as this bad lurking thing. Quality, I think people see much more positively. How would you connect the two? Yeah, great question. And it's so great to have our med students here. So kudos to my friends for uh, joining. Um, the... Overall, most people would say, you know, quality is, you could think of it as the clinical outcomes and value adds the cost to that. So it's, in other words, it's quality is the outcomes that we produce and value is the outcomes and the cost that it takes to produce those. And, and I completely agree that it has this connotation or looking at cost as if it's dirty but let me like just ask about our personal life. Okay, so I'll admit I like wine, but like I'm maniacal about not overpaying for wine. So I'll look for like a ten or eleven dollar bottle of wine that has good points, really good value, right? Where or whether you're buying a car or buying a house, or uh, I also if I buy suits, I always look for like Monsanto because I hate wasting. My, we do it in our own lives, right? But we'll give people crazy expensive drugs, or you know, I. I'll keep you an extra night in the ICU because I'm like a word about you, right? Well, with 20% copay, that's costing somebody a thousand dollars a night. Like, okay, do they really want to risk Carlton expense for a night, like, you know, to keep comfortable? And and how do we balance, you know, some of those waste you know, that, that we have? And 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 the system's riddled with waste and it's bankrupting people. So I think that we have to be comfortable uh you know beginning to to look at that like i was sharing some of with you um we're looking at the use of the surgical robot this is medical grand rounds but there's you know some evidence in certain specific cases that make a difference most other cases no evidence whatsoever but it's growing in use largely because of marketing of of the the company creating like this fear that we're falling behind in the use of the robot so we looked at inguinal hernia. About 40% of our inguinal hernia cases use the robot. If you don't use it, we make about $1,800. If you do use it, we lose $1,800, right? Say, so, okay, like, and, and the patient's bill is higher, their co pays higher. Okay, like, is that okay? And there's tons of things where we open up supplies we don't use or we're not mindful of, of you know, longer lengths of stay when we do have things in our control. So, I think you're right, and it's and and we absolutely need to uh, be mindful of uh, the the waste. So let me just end with with a plea that I'd ask you to reflect for a moment on thinking about when you were part of a team that you felt like you were working with illuminators that that or you felt that love, meaning you were energized. You felt empowered, you were unleashed and inspired. You weren't that flea, but you can solve problems, right? And I just ask you to see, and it could be healthcare. It could be in school. It could be at church. It could be at camp. It could be on vacation. But we've all felt that what it feels like to be living and leading with love where you're inspired, your ideas are heard. And just tap into that feeling of joy that you had. Because not only is it more effective, far more effective, it's a lot more joyful, right? And why wouldn't we want to go through a workday where we're feeling the joy or because it's just so much more happier than being grumpy and, 
you know, fighting with each other and being diminishers. And so I would uh, leave you with the message that we create the culture at UH every day and every one of us. And it's got a really short half-life, about the half-life of epinephrine. And we create it by the behaviors that we choose to take every day, whether we smile at the EVS worker, or thank them for what they do to keep patients safe, or we're kind to each other, or we encourage each other's ideas, or we brainstorm how to solve problems rather than shoot ideas down. Like you are QH, you are the culture. And I hope you take that seriously. And I hope you choose to be an illuminator uh, every day. So thank you and happy safety week.